I want to thank everybody for here for uh, joining us on this day two of the XR Access Symposium. Um, both those of you who are able to, to make it in here and get loaded up on coffee and pastries, uh, and those of you online who have had to supply your own coffee and pastries. Um, I'm Dylan Fox. I am the uh, Director of Operations for XR Access, uh, and today we have a, a really jam-packed schedule for you. Um, we've got... Uh, Starting off, we're going to roll right into our first panel here on Social Sense XR, uh, making the invisible visible. Um, following that, uh, we have a talk by Jamie Bykov brett on building an accessible and inclusive metaverse. Um, then Hrishi Mule is going to talk about annotated lip reading for augmented re educational systems. Uh, we'll have a nice coffee and pastry break. Um, then at 11.20, we'll pick up with multidimensional computing accessibility in the age of XR and AI by Liv Erickson. Uh, and we'll finish things off with vision accessibility with AR and AI tools uh, with Sean and Jeffrey from Lighthouse. Um, and then we will have some closing remarks uh, from the XR Access team. So with that said, let's jump right into our first panel here, uh, Social Sense XR, making the invisible visible. Um, so this project is a National Science Foundation Convergence Accelerator project. Um, which means we are kind of ramping up very quickly um, on the question of how we can make uh, nonverbal communication in XR spaces accessible to blind and low vision individuals. Um, that means taking those nonverbal cues uh, and turning them into um, from visual to uh, audio and haptic cues that uh, people will be able to understand. Um, and that is really just the tip of the iceberg. But before I get too deep into it, uh, let's go ahead and introduce our speakers, um, and then we can get into the questions. Um, and I should note as well, before we get started, that this is really in its early stages, and one of our goals in bringing this panel to you is to get your feedback, um, to help us understand from your perspective uh, what we should be thinking about, what opportunities that you in the audience see um, and so please make sure to share those in the Q&A section and also on our Slack. Um, we should note as well, we will go back to the schedule here real quick, um, that you can join us on Slack. Uh, it's bit.ly slash xraccess dash github, uh, sorry, dash Slack. Got too many links running around in my brain. Um, you can join us on the symposium channel to share feedback and questions for the uh, presenters. Um, you can also uh, get the captions for today um, at the link you see on the slides here, and I will have uh, one of our volunteers kindly copy that link into the Zoom and the Slack. Uh, so, with that said, let's introduce our panel. Um, Sean, do you want to start? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Doherty. Um, I work as the manager of corporate relationships uh, within Access Technology um, at Lighthouse San Francisco. Um, we are focused on um, supporting the blind and low vision community um, on a wide range of services. Um, we do a lot of direct service work, um, training uh, with blind and low vision individuals uh, throughout the state of California. Uh, we perform technology assessments. Um, and then my team is focused on doing uh, user research and supporting um, tech companies, startups, user research agencies uh, that are helping make websites and apps um, and different forms of technology um, accessible. So it's great to be here with you today. Thanks for having me. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Shiri? Hello again, everyone. I'm Shiri Azenkot. I'm the director at XR Access, but then I'm also a professor at Cornell Tech. And um, I'm the principal investigator for this project. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Lapierre. I'm the principal accessibility and content quality architect at Benetech, a nonprofit in Silicon Valley. Uh, we do uh, document our book accessibility. Uh, Bookshare is our main uh, product. And I work a lot in the standard space in the W3C, helping make those documents accessible and now to the extension, making, trying to make virtual reality and augmented and VR, XR uh, also accessible. And yeah, we should, we should <laughs> talk for everybody. Uh, I'm Andrea stevenson Wan. I'm an associate professor at Cornell University in Ithaca. Um, and I'm the director of the virtual embodiment lab there. We have a lot of wonderful students here. 
um, from the lab, and we focus on um, tracking and um, transforming people's uh, behavior appearance from the physical world to the virtual world. So I'm really happy to be able to participate in this project. Awesome. <laughs> So our first question um, is just to, to get some definition here. What is social XR and why is it important to make it accessible? Um, Shiri, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, so we've already seen some projects that are focusing on social XR yesterday, um, and in particular social VR. And that's just the idea that we'll be able to have multiple people in a virtual environment interacting. So um, we started out yesterday with a VR guide presentation. So they already gave an intro saying that um, there are some applications that already exist today, some platforms like VR Chat and Rec Room, where people can come into a virtual space together and interact. They can talk to one another. They can move around. Um, and, and the powerful thing about doing this in VR as opposed to just Zoom or some other video conferencing is that you have many more affordances, um, so you can interact with people in a much more natural way because you can virtually move around the space, similar to how we move around in real life, so you have this proximity cue. Um, the VR systems are also getting much better at capturing our gestures, so just like I'm gesturing now, um, you could see other avatars gesturing and even other avatars' facial expressions. So this is an area that um, we see trending. And because it's such a powerful way to interact with people remotely, uh, we, will, we believe that we will continue to see a lot more interactions, social interactions, in various uh, virtual spaces in, as we move into the future. So I'm actually going to add an anecdote. So last night, I met some um, friends in Brooklyn, and, and we were talking about our projects. And um, someone said, oh, I have a headset, and I use it to play chess with my brother in uh, virtual reality. He's in Germany. I can't see him. And so he talked about um, this sense that he was really there and the ability to sort of like lean across the table together and like recognize his typical gestures. But because um, those are generally just represented visually currently, that means that, that all of these cues are dropping out of the, uh, of the interaction. So it gives us this um, opportunity to um, have that sense of presence to multiple people. Right, right. So what we realized was that uh, all of these cues, these behaviors that make VR more powerful, many of them are actually completely inaccessible to people who are blind and low vision. Uh, so if you are blind or low vision, you can go into a virtual space, right? And you can talk to other people just like you can on Zoom. And you can hear them speaking. Um, if you know them, you might be able to recognize who they are. But then the problem is you're losing all that other rich uh, information that's part of the communication, like the gestures, the expressions, the proximity cues, how close or far people are from you, and, uh, and also who people are, right? If you don't necessarily hear them speaking and, and recognize their voice, you might not even know who's around you. So these are major barriers to having an equitable experience for people who are blind and low vision. And we, looking back at all of the research and some development that's been done in VR so far, we're seeing that there's a lot of attention that has been paid to making um, the basic aspects of the environment more perceivable. So being able to navigate in a virtual environment, being able to uh, perceive and understand what objects are around you, and even to interact with those objects. But up until the point where we started this project, there was very, very little work looking at the social interaction in virtual reality and thinking about how that can be made more accessible. So that's what motivated this project, and that's what we wanted to do. Absolutely. Um, Sean or Charles, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that was well done. Yep. Awesome. Um, and just really quick, can everybody hear uh, Andrea? Because you sound a little quiet. Yeah. Um, I need to reposition the microphone side. Oh, OK. <laughs> Okay, how about this? Uh, that's ah. Better. <laughs> okay, a 
Apparently, I need to bellow a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> right. I can do that. Um, Beautiful. Okay. Um, great. So, uh, next question is that um, one of the, the unique things about the um, NSF convergence accelerator, accelerator words, uh, is that idea of convergence. And so here we see that reflected in the fact that we have three organizations, um, Cornell, Benetech, and Lighthouse, uh, that are coming together to make this project a success. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of what role each of our organizations plays in this project, um, both what we've already done and what we're looking to do moving forward. Um, Sean, I'll, I'll have you start, because I know Lighthouse has done a lot already in user testing. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it's been a really great partnership um, between our three organizations. Um, we're all um, in the nonprofit space, but all have different um, expertise. Uh, and so I think we've shown that it's also effective to be able to work uh, remotely um, across the US, um, given that we're all kind of in different locations and we've been able to collaborate and many of us are meeting in person for the first time uh, during this conference, which has been really exciting. Um, but we've been able to, uh, to even ac across the US as we're working together, um, execute um, user research um, in this space uh, with blind and low vision um, users. And we did a lot of that testing um, in person with user interviews um, in San Francisco. Um, but we had our, our researchers and our PhD students from Cornell that were um, helping co-facilitate that. Uh, remotely, um, and so that collaboration was really exciting, and um, yeah, there's been great synergies between between our teams. Awesome. Uh, Shiri, we'll just go down the line here. Yeah, um, so our role is as the main accessibility design group uh, as part of this team, so my students and I, my lab, we have a lot of experience in designing for accessibility, and particularly designing for XR accessibility. So, I mean, it's no accident that I started uh, XR Access because that's our main research interest. Right. And uh, Benetech, our role is um, helping make documents uh, accessible. So in the VR space, potentially making the, that whiteboard experience or uh, presentations, uh, PowerPoints, et cetera, uh, accessible so that you get that full, not only the social, but also what's being um, displayed discussed or displayed, uh, as well as our expertise, our, um, our resources uh, with our marketing department and things like that, that we can help uh, facilitate with, uh, enhance this project. And I think um, what we're hoping to bring from the Virtual Embodiment Lab is thinking about um, how we can represent these cues. So we can, and a lot of social VR does do, try to do kind of a one-to-one -one representation, like I move my hand and that hand gesture is represented uh, by my avatar's hand. But that's an option, right? We have much richer options in terms of how we represent behavior that we can pull in from these uh, systems, so thinking about um, how we can render information that can be presented visually and um, haptically through touch and through sound. So pulling on that, um, our uh, background in transforming social interaction to, um, to help uh, ideate through design processes. Awesome. Um, so I'd love to, to dig a little bit deeper into uh, you know, the, the progress that we've made so far. Um, and I know a lot of that has been on user research. Um, so Sean, I'd love to give you a chance to, to do a little bit more of a deep dive into what we've learned in the, the focus groups and the user research that we've done so far. Um, and then uh, maybe our other panelists can talk about what some of our next steps are now that we have uh, a little bit more knowledge about our user base. Sure, uh, sounds great. Yeah, we've been pretty busy um, on the user research side collectively. Um, we have conducted five um, expert level interviews uh, with uh, platform owners and standards organizations. Um, so companies like Mozilla, Meta, um, we met with Microsoft, um, W3C, um, to understand um, how platforms are being used currently within XR, um, where some of the accessibility considerations are, I mean, kind of where we're at, and then also looking at the kind of the standards going forward. Um, and then on the user research side, um, we were able to conduct um, three in-person focus groups, um, and we involved um, 22 blind and low vision participants. Um, and as I mentioned, we recruited those users and conducted that research in person um, in the San Francisco area uh, with support uh, from 
uh, are the Cornell PhD students that are working on the project, uh, which is really great. So we co-facilitated that research together. Um, we conducted those uh, sessions uh, as 90-minute sessions that were co-facilitated between XR Access and Lighthouse. Um, and we had some, some good insights that came out of it. Um, essentially, the, the questions itself, um, we were focusing a lot on individuals' experiences with current technology. Um, so how they're currently using um, video meeting platforms today, uh, so, such as Zoom and Teams, um, and what their experiences have been with the accessibility of those platforms. Um, and then using that to think about um, how some of those learnings could apply uh, to XR. Um, and so we, we ask about people's experiences with VR today, um, if they've used um, uh, things like Mozilla Hubs or Horizon Worlds, um, and what their, what their experience has been. Um, we also asked a lot about the usage of nonverbal social cues. Um, so things like gestures, facial expressions, eye gaze, um, and what individuals think about that um, that are blind or low vision. Um, and we also focused on a lot of the accessibility challenges with current technologies. Um, so those were some of, the, some of the questions that we asked um, can go into the results as well, but um, I don't know, team, anything to add about the, the questions or how we framed up the research? Yeah, so it is a pretty interesting question. How do you do user-centered research for accessible VR or accessible XR in general, right? Because with a user-centered process, and that's always the kind of process that we are trying to do, um, if we, we typically go to the target users first, right? We go to them and we want to get some of their ideas, learn from their current experiences, and figure out how it can be improved. But of course, the problem is that they don't have ex many experiences with VR because it's not accessible. So where do you start? So on the one hand, we want to get input from the community. But on the other hand, the community hasn't had the experience yet uh, from which to provide us with input. So what Chan was describing was what we ended up doing, which is to try and learn from people's experiences from other uh, situations and other tools and platforms. So from VR interactions, we can, we can learn about uh, how to design those from experiences that people have in the physical world, just talking to each other the way we talk to each other um, you know, day to day lives. Uh, and we can also learn from people's current challenges with Zoom and platforms um, that have like two-dimensional representations of other people. So that's what we did. And, and one thing that we, I was at least a little bit surprised to learn was that there were quite a few people who had some minimal VR experience. So even though the platforms are mostly inaccessible right now, you actually did get people who had some experiences in VR. We, we did. I believe it was about a third of our participants. Um, and so they had some thoughts already on how accessible the technology is and how they're using it today, which, which was interesting. And as we move forward with kind of some of our prototypes uh, and testing in the future, hopefully we can involve those individuals more uh, in, our, in our deeper research. Yeah. Right. We're actually building some uh, low fidelity prototypes. Uh, and then we plan on bringing those back to the, that, those focus groups and getting their reaction on some of these um, ideas that we're coming up with. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I know there's so many interesting things for me that, that came out of that. Um, I mean, just the ways that, that VR is different from Zoom, is different from like a conference call, uh, reveals a lot about the way that, um, you know, a lot of blind folks uh, think about these technologies, right? I know one of the things that, that was surprising for me was that, um, you know, we talked about the ability to have these virtual conversations, virtual meetings, and that was of some interest to people, but uh, I, I think we've had a lot of interest in the idea of like, virtual reality museums, things where you can bring in that mm -hmm. kind of multi-sensory aspect of XR um, and have haptics and have things that you, you can't do when it's just kind of you talking to your computer screen in a, a, a you know, muted Zoom room. Um, so I'd love to, to just dig a little bit more into that, um, thinking about uh, the use of sound, um, the use of haptics, uh, and some of the particular types of nonverbal cues that we're, we're thinking about converting into these. Uh, I'd love to, to just help kind of paint a picture for our audience of 
what are these cues and, and how are we thinking about converting them? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing we definitely learned is that social cues are really vital, um, but they are really challenging for blind and low vision individuals in virtual environments. Um, when we're in person and we're presenting, we can kind of read the room, we can hear what's going on. Uh, but when we're on Zoom or in an XR environment, um, those cues are often lost um, or are not uh, transmitted in a, in a non-visual way uh, where, where we're able to, to read them and, and kind of process them. Uh, so that's definitely one of our, one of our takeaways there. Um, that, was, that was pretty interesting. Anything to add or share? <laughs> um, well, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about uh, what kinds of um, cues people were interested in. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so people, people were interested in a wide range of things. Um, we, we looked at, uh, at eye gaze, um, at kind of um, acknowledgement and encouragement, like head nodding, um, smiling, um, basically directing attention. Um, people were interested to know that, you know, if they're presenting, um, who's paying attention in the room? Are people kind of looking their way? Um, and when we, t when we started thinking about these kind of virtual experiences, one of the use cases we thought about was a virtual conference where maybe people are gathering um, in areas of a VR environment um, and talking about a subject matter. And so for a blind or low vision individual to kind of uh, walk up to that group virtually and understand are people you know, paying attention? Are they focusing their attention in their direction? Um, and so those are cues that we're, we're starting to kind of uh, think about. Um, but there are some others as well. And I know in addition to the, those kind of personal cues, there's also, uh, we've been doing a lot of thinking around um, the other visual aspects of the environment that uh, are currently um, not accessible to people that are blind or low vision. Um, Charles, I was hoping you might add a little bit from Benetech's perspective about how we're thinking about converting those elements to uh, audio and haptics as well. Um, what aspects? Sorry, uh, just the it. other <clears throat> kind of visual aspects of VR spaces. Right. So yeah, you scan your environment, and you don't know what you can interact with. You want things to be uh, identifiable, labeled, and um, accessible, so that you can in query, you know, uh, or you know, uh, an object to know. Oh, what is this thing that I just ran into? If there's like a warning that you you bumped into some object, you want to be able to have that information, and that all then goes into the standards on how do you add that accessibility metadata to those objects in VR and AR, as well as what's on this whiteboard that I'm looking at right now, uh, you know, to be able to query that, query that, and say, okay, what what's on here? And maybe you get some AI, you do some OCR recognition. And then you get that information uh, presented back to you. Absolutely. Sure, I'm just going to add that um, one of the things that's um, exciting about where we are with, even though we know that the current headsets are still in what will look like a very primitive stage, it's like we have these audio and haptic channels. And I really appreciated the presentation yesterday from Con Cosmonius High that started to look at this mm -hmm. idea of like, well, you can enhance visual aspects, but these other channels are really underused. Um, and so there's, and when we think about augmenting social experiences like that, that also opens up um, making this accessible to other um, user groups too. So um, this is a, um, this starting point um, can push us to investigate those other channels um, and then we will find many more uses for them too. Just, yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh, just going off of that as well, um, another takeaway from the research was just um, how precious of a resource audio is and thinking about um, you know, communicating these social cues in a non-visual way um, and using a combination of audio and haptics to do that. Um, but one of the challenges is that um, for blind users that are, that are using screen readers, um, particularly if they're presenting, so if we're thinking about a conference setting or a workplace presentation, um, if a blind individual is using a screen reader, they're already relying on that uh, audio channel to maybe read their presentation notes or um, listen to other cues and alerts, uh, such as in Zoom, when people are, are exiting the room or entering the room, uh, maybe they're getting that alert. There is also the chat. Um, so there's a lot of competition for audio uh, space. And so when we're thinking about these um, nonverbal social cues and ways to communicate them, um, 
we have to think very carefully about how we present that audio and um, how it could be competing with other audio that individuals might be listening to. Um, so I think um, back to the presentation on Harmonious High yesterday, thinking about audio ducking in different ways to present that audio is really important. And the audio itself, like what, do you, uh, what are the sound effects that you want to associate with a certain gesture? It was very interesting. Like a head nod, you could hear, mm-hmm. But then is that the person actually saying that or is this an audio cue that was added on? So having those type of distinctions and what makes sense uh, so that you're not, you don't, don't have this steep learning curve but also understand what's happening. And then something else that came up is the idea that people uh, may have preferences depending on the situation or depending on how they like to handle this information. So the ability to customize how this information is presented to you is something that will um, be really necessary to, under to explore and understand better. Absolutely. Um, and I, I'd like to dig a little bit more into uh, the goals of the project, you know, both short term and long term, right? What are we hoping to accomplish? How are we going to um, take these lessons that we're learning about nonverbal cues and put them into practice, um, make sure that they actually get into experiences that people can use? Um, and then assuming that we're able to do that, what is the impact of this, you know, 5, 10, 15 years down the line? on the experience of disabled people using XR? Well, one thing for my perspective from Benetech, we're heavily into the standard space uh, with the W3C. To, so to integrate these uh, APIs or what have you in order to make objects accessible, to, uh, you know, to have a channels for this uh, back channel of uh, social interaction, social information uh, presented getting that in the standards so that all manufacturers of these headsets and these platforms start building on those APIs, well, it's built in from the beginning. And that's a born accessible approach to, uh, to this work instead of after the fact, bolt on, okay, now we have to make it accessible. Uh, how do we do that? Oh, well, Microsoft has done it this way and Apple's done it that way. And to have that common uh, you know, uh, standards uh, built in from the beginning, that is the way to, to do this. And so getting that information out and in, you know, done correctly at the beginning uh, while this is in its infancy, I think is huge. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as I'm sure most of you know, there is a set of accessibility standards that exists today and they apply to the web mainly, but people uh, extrapolate from that and apply them to other platforms as well. Um, but now that we're in VR, we're dealing with a completely different paradigm of computing, right? So we have some current standards uh, for VR accessibility that have, you know, XR Access collaborated with um, some other organizations to create them, and some of the um, manufacturers of the VR platforms wrote their own. But what we're seeing right now is that they're still pretty basic, right? We're still kind of in the infancy stage of XR accessibility. So these, these standards that do exist, these guidelines, I should say, they're not standards yet, the guidelines that do exist so far are very much just current best practices that we have from other platforms. But again, in VR, it's not like the web. It's not like phones. We're not dealing with a two-dimensional screen here. We're dealing with these more naturalistic interactions among people as well. So we want to make sure that these guidelines, which will eventually become standards, include that new aspect of computing that's now very, very important to consider. Fantastic. Um, and I think my last question here before we take a few from the audience. Um, is that you know we've talked already to, uh, in the symposium about the curb cut effect, right? Which is when you make something uh, accessible for people, you make it better for everyone. Um, what do you see uh, as the benefits for not just blind and low vision people who are their kind of initial targets for this research, um, but for other disabled people and for abled people uh, as a result of making these more accessible? Well, one obvious is that you know. Um, 
these social cues could be beneficial to many different types of disabilities, not just the visually impaired. You know, you have uh, the hearing impaired that it can also benefit if we put as some of these as tactile, um, you know, or, you know, you got a cognitive disability and you don't understand what it means when a person's smiling or frowning or shaking, you know, so there's these types of things that can help. And if you're not looking at the screen or you're not looking the right, then, you hear, you get that in extra information. So multiple modalities help in a number of different situations, not just for a visually impaired situation. And we can also think about taking this, we've been working in virtual reality, so like immersive virtual reality, but thinking about how these tools could be useful in augmented or mixed reality, how they could, we could even conceive of them as um, changing how we interact with the physical world. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. there's, so it's really exciting to think about the sort of um, uh, ways in which this could move into the physical space and into other forms of, of uh, XR. Exactly. Yeah, and I think some of the use cases that we that we looked at, um, particularly when we were looking at presenting um, or you know meeting in a space in a virtual environment. Um, even for, for sighted individuals, um, when they're presenting, it's hard to kind of read the room and understand how engaged people are during a presentation on Zoom or in XR. So um, hopefully some of these uh, areas we're working on with the social cues uh, and communicating those in different ways will give all users the ability to kind of read the room, understand engagement, and have that as a channel. Um, and then also I think the ability to customize uh, whether it's audio or haptics or different inputs and outputs, that customization is something that I think will benefit all users in this space so that they can set up the experience in a way that works uh, for their needs. Excellent. All right. Well, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience, um, both in person here and online. Uh, I see Kent right here. Uh, do we have our mic runners handy? Yes, here, here they come. Yeah, I just want to ask a question around haptics because I know that with the controllers for VR, they have haptics built into the controllers, but there's also like other haptic devices like the um, sub pack or the neosensory vest or B haptics and, you know, onto even more expensive haptic devices. But I'm wondering if you've started to explore with other types of haptic devices and if there's a sort of emergent grammar or language that could be developed to start to represent things more abstractly or symbolically and create a way of uh, uh, creating a synthesis between these things to elaborate on this new multimodal language. So yeah, I'd love to hear any thoughts on that. Yeah, haptics um, are very important, right? We, we talked earlier about sound and how sound is being overloaded and over used for many different f signals and a lot of information. So haptics are, that's a continuous theme, the importance of haptics that has come up throughout the research. And for now, we are focused on mainstream platforms. So our goal is to make existing, uh, any VR application that's designed to look at how we can make that fully accessible and inclusive to everyone. You know, in, in our case, we're looking at blind and low vision people in particular. Um, so. We have not looked at any like specialized uh, experimental haptics yet, but I think there's a ton of potential there. So I'll be really curious to see like what comes out and becomes quote unquote mainstream in the next few years um, and to see how we can play with that and leverage it. So starting with the hand controllers, which have these very, very simple, like you can change the, the um, tempo. It's like they're very minimal. Uh, but we talk about the other devices that are kind of coming on the market now a lot. And I think if we think about um, the uh, our current haptic controllers as being like the sort of Morse code of haptic communication, and then maybe we'll have uh, you know a full piano in the future. <laughs> I know one of, um, I think, our, our design inspirations that, uh, at least I know I, I currently intend to look into, is um, tactile sign language. Because um, I know that obviously has a very kind of well-developed system and has lots of different um, mechanisms for communicating different things through touch. Um, and so I think that could be a, a very good source of inspiration for us as we kind of move into the design phases of the project. Um, let's see, next question. I see in the front row here. 
<coughs> Hi, uh, so this is a question for like anyone. Um, I was wondering what general strategies that you've tried or seen to, I guess, like promote or incentivize social XR companies or platforms to uh, comply with these kinds of accessibility standards or at least learn more about them? That's a big question. <laughs> um, I mean, in general, how do you get companies to actually make their products accessible, right? We, we talk about that all the time. Um, so I think that what we have done specifically for this project is to in, start to engage with uh, some of the major players in terms of VR platforms and to talk to them about what, um, could, what we can do that will help them incorporate uh, the ideas that we come up with into their platforms, right? Again, we want to make mainstream VR accessible. We don't want to design our own VR platforms. That's not realistic. We don't have the resources for that. So we talk to the people at Google, we talk to the people at Meta, and we want to find out what can we as researchers uh, do to make it as easy as possible for them to help them, incentivize them to incorporate what we have learned into what they already have as products. And the thing is, if we build it into the APIs and the foundation of these things, they'll be using it by default. And, uh, you know, so then if they have to just add some extra tags, that's real simple compared to putting in a whole infrastructure on how to make things accessible. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I think we had a question in the back, and then we'll come back to the front, and then maybe see if there's any questions from our online community. Uh, more of a statement. I, I'll be very quick. Uh, the whole idea of the haptic language. Um, my name is Joel Ward. If anybody's interested in that, please connect with me. I'm making some connections across academia and also within uh, my company, Bruce Allen. I'm very interested in sort of pr pursuing that, and I realize it's a long-term goal, but um, and tie, really tying into what you guys are doing. Um, we have a deafblind employee and actually is working with her, and we haven't really talked about deafblind here as much. Um, she's very interested in how could she experience uh, VR at all and would love to try it and would love to interact with it and not only understand it, but also use that as a, as a, um, a way to actually do things and, and create content and understand content. So just statement, I don't know if there's any, any responses to that, but um, if anybody's interested, Joel Ward, please connect with me. I'd love to talk ideas. My comment is actually related to Joel. We were kind of just on the same page. I wanted to quickly um, just mention in the deafblind community that systems related to tactile sign language, I wanted to mention protactile. Um, that's, that's a way of showing a deafblind person how you, how the audience is interacting and responding. Um, so that system is it's actually more simple than just a full tactile sign language. But like you kind of, um, you give like social cues on the back or on the wrist or on the top of the knee or the thigh. Um, so that seems to be more like a low hanging fruit that's more accessible I think that maybe we could give that a try first. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, any responses to that or? Well, I, I think um, at least from the Lighthouse side, so we, we have a deafblind team um, and they are focused on supporting um, that community on direct service work and training. Um, and uh, when, when they do communicate and interact, they are using some of those kind of haptic devices that you're describing um, as well as, uh, you know, tactile sign language. So. Yeah, I mean, I think those are maybe uh, those tactile devices that can go on different parts of the body might be something that, you know, we could explore as part of our research as well. Um, but yeah, we're, we're open to lots of angles. And um, but I think it is a challenge to, to not only make this accessible for blind and low vision individuals, but also for, for deafblind uh, users. And, and it's an, another challenge for us to tackle, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're running very low on time, but I do want to check in with our online community uh, and see if there are any questions coming from there. Have any of our volunteers? Right there. 
Uh, hold on, can we get the mic? What type of features do you feel are important to consider for those creating experiences that can be accessed through different forms of hardware? For example, some social VR platforms can also be accessed on a desktop. Haptics, for example, can also be experienced on mobile phones. Yeah. Anybody want to respond to that? I, I guess I'm thinking, I'm not sure that if the question is, um, are what should be, people be able to do in the uh, in the social platforms? Because I think cross-platform social VR has a lot of value in general. So if the question is, um, you know, should people still consider developing cross-platform? That feels like a clear yes. Um, but maybe somebody else had a different interpretation. Yeah, I think maybe the question is um, meant to ask about the sorts of cues, how we how we plan on transforming them to more accessible versions, given that these social platforms can be accessed from different platforms. And um, yeah, did you want to no, comment I, on that? I think that's, that's basically it. And, and that'll be up to the platform developer and how to interpret these, these uh, signals coming from the VR space that's saying, oh, this social cue just happened, play this sound effect or play this sound effect and then if available, add this tactile um, pattern, um, you know, and do it that way. Yeah, yeah, I think what, what Charles is saying is more generally is that we're looking at a lot of multimodal signals. So, you know, you, you get audio and maybe haptic, some kind of haptic um, feedback in addition to that. So. If you're using a more limited platform like a desktop, which doesn't have a controller that can buzz, then you can at least get the audio signal. Right. And maybe not just the audio. Maybe it's, yeah. uh, it would say, oh, and that'll convert it to uh, a nod or like the actual text nod so right. that a person using a Braille display would see nodding or shaking their head or what have you, right? So it could be interpreted in multiple different ways. Right, so it's a very good question. Um, I think for the most part now we've been focused on uh, headset um, setup, headset with controllers. Kind of, we've been using the MetaQuest devices, but um, but it's a very good point that you know these different social VR platforms they they are and should be available through different platforms, and so that's something that we should definitely be considering moving forward. Awesome. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions, but uh, I'd like to thank our panelists um, for coming up here. Can we get a round of applause?